Some of the most common questions I get are about jointers. In fact, I have been sort of really brushing up on my jointer technique after I had a jointer injury about a year and a couple months ago. There can be very intimidating machines. So I wanted to take you from start to finish, how to use it, proper safety, tips and tricks, how to use all the cool little features that you didn't even know existed on a jointer, as well as some buying advice for buying used jointers, because I feel like it's a really common tool in the secondary portion of your woodworking education or knowledge consumption. So let's first talk about how it works, and I wanna show you a really cool slow-mo clip we recorded last year. So I've lowered the infeed side way more than you ever should to accentuate sort of showing how it works. And as you can see in this slow-mo clip, we did the same thing. Now, you have an infeed side that is coplanar with your outfeed side, and you're gonna start by pushing a board through. Now, the jointer is gonna take a scallop from the bottom and the outfeed side, which is dead even with the very top cutting portion of your cutter head, so at the very, very top, it's just at the exact same plane, and then it's gonna start referencing off the top. So you're gonna change your pressure over to the top as soon as you're able to fit a hand up there, and this is where you're going to push down. You can use a push stick from the back to sort of give it momentum this way, but and we're gonna talk about safety more in a second. If you've got nice waxed beds, you shouldn't need to. Then you're gonna to continue to push through and it's gonna continue this scallop throughout until you have a side that is completely flat on your outfeed side. And you never really wanna take giant passes like you see here, maybe eighth of an inch max if you have a nice big jointer, but usually much less 16th or 32nd. And you're gonna continue those passes until you have a flat side. Now, once you've created a flat side, it's time to do an edge. I like to mark my flat sides with a little Jesus fish looking thing because that way when I go over to the planer, I know which side to put down and which side to put up. So normally this would be on the back, but for shooting, we'll show you this way. Then you're gonna run it through the same way. It's gonna start to scallop the board and you're gonna keep it against the fence. And the reason you do it in this order where you do a face and then an edge is because you need a flat reference for your fence. Now, let me show you the safe way to do this because this is how I hurt myself is I was trying too hard to push a board uh, because I hadn't waxed my tables yet. It was really tough to push through. So I was trying really hard to hold it to the fence and I just ran my thumb over the joiner. So this is something that is really important to know. One, of course, you should always have your guard in place, but I like to keep a hand on the top of the fence. But of course you never put your hands in this area. So you start with something to push it against the fence. And as you get just past, I keep my hand on the fence here and push it through like this, switching over. And this way, if anything happens, let's say you trip or you know the board flaps forward or something like that, you always have the fence to sort of brace yourself and catch yourself as a last ditch effort. In fact, let's talk a little bit more about safety and then we'll get into some of the really cool features like the rabbiting ledge and how to joint a board that is wider than your jointer. Okay, there's four things in jointer safety that you should never compromise on. First is wax. Waxing a jointer is really important. You don't have to do it every time you use a jointer, but you should do it regularly. Your board should slide smoothly on the jointer surface. The last thing you want is to, for it to be hard to push a board through a cut when you've got something spinning at 5,000 RPMs that'll suck your hand right off. Two, fence. Your fence should always be set so that no portion of the cutter head is exposed on the left side of the board. So if I was doing this edge, this fence should be right here. And that would have saved me with my thumb. I would have been still close, but I wouldn't have hit the cutter because there would have been none exposed. Three, of course, or I'm sorry, four. Are we on two or three or four? <laughs> the guard, you should always have your guard in place. There should never be a reason to take it off with one very small exception we're gonna talk about when we talk about the jointing ledge. But always place your guard. Mine needs to be I need to loosen the spring and reset it when I move the fence back, so that way it, it is correct. The other thing is cutting depth. You should never be taking more than like a 32nd to a 16th on an underpowered jointer, and on a bigger jointer, I think maybe an eighth would be the max I would ever do. And then of course, always use push sticks. Never use your hands. I see people use like gloves sometimes, which I think if you're doing like eight quarter material and there's a ton of material, I could understand why people do it, but for me, I never go without a push stick because that puts another barrier in between you and your cutter head. And then again, if you haven't purchased a joiner yet, there's some European guards that you can get. 
those are the ones that go over the cutter head and so you have to actually physically lift your hands up to go over the cutter head protector and go to the other side so they're a little bit safer and certainly would be something I recommend if you have that option. Now, Jonathan, you're saying, well, well, then why do they go down to a quarter inch, sometimes even further? Well, that's where this rabbiting ledge comes into play. So let's talk about that. It works for two things. One, creating rabbits, and two, jointing boards wider than your jointer. So for the rabbiting ledge, you would need to remove your guard. I think that would be the case with the European style as well. And you also need to make sure that this piece, which is called your rabbiting ledge, is parallel with your infeed table. Now, the way this works is you're gonna slide your fence over and you can see this is gonna be the max depth that you can wrap it. I think on my machine it's half an inch, probably the same for a lot of eight inch or 12 inch jointers, probably less for a six inch. And you're gonna set your cutter head. So we're gonna do, let's say a half inch by quarter inch rabbit which means we're gonna go a quarter inch down and a half inch in. One of the things you wanna make sure of, I know on my jointer, this fence can move a little bit this way. So you just wanna make sure that it's even throughout and that you're at half an inch on both sides. And then you're gonna lock your fence down. Now you don't wanna take your quarter inch pass all at once. So I'm gonna start with an eighth inch. We'll do two passes and we're gonna get a nice rabbit on the inside of this board. All right, next we are going to joint a board that is wider than our jointer. Now, I have this piece of mahogany. You can tell it has a little twist in it, so it needs to be jointed. Unfortunately, my jointer is not as wide as this board. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take off our rabbiting ledge and we're going to make sure, and I was having a little bit of trouble when I was running that rabbit because I, my table at some point has become a very fraction of a very small amount lower than my cutter head. So this is really easy to set. If you have straight knife cutter heads, you can create a little jig with magnets. We've got some great magnets over at KM Tools, the ones we use in the dovetail jigs, to create two boards that hold your blade up as you tighten it. And then what you do is you take your cutter head, running it backwards, and you wanna look right here. I've exaggerated this a little bit. I've lowered this table just a little bit so you can see. Now watch the square right about the nine and a half there. See how it lifts up? That's no bueno. You want it to, just barely come in contact with the square without lifting it up. So you can see here, I've gone too far. It'll grab the square just a little bit. So I'm just gonna lower it a little bit at a time just so it grabs the square here. Yep, I can just feel it moving the square, but it doesn't lift it up. That's how you know you have it just perfect. So you can see after one pass here, we haven't quite got all the way through here. So we wanna go until we have a nice, just little ledge all the way across. And that way you'll know this area is flat and I'll show you how to put it in the planer. Okay, so now that we have a nice little lip across the whole thing, we know this is flat. All we have to do is take a piece of plywood because we know that plywood is flat. We're gonna run it through with this side down like this. And then once the top is flat, we know it's gonna be parallel. We're gonna flip it over and then we can just plane off this little lip here. All right, so now we have a board, it's flat and parallel that was wider than our joiner. It's such a great trick for, but I hate taking off the guard. Ever since I hurt myself, I'm terrified of this thing, which is okay because being terrified makes you respect it all that much more and take the proper precautions when you're using it. Last couple things you should know about use and safety. A jointer is only as accurate as twice its outfeed length. You can actually improve that by getting something like this, like an outfeed roller help you do longer boards, but you wanna remember that if you get, you know, if you're trying to join a 20 foot long two by four or something, it's probably not gonna be completely straight all the way across. Lastly, the thickness of material. You never wanna run anything thinner than a half an inch because if you take away so much material that this board becomes compromised and weak, 
and you're pushing down on it, it could shatter or get pushed into the knives and you, you know, who knows what happens. I would hate to see that. You wanna make sure you're more than half an inch. And honestly, if you're jointing half an inch, you're probably cutting it too close anyway. So now that we've talked about use, let's talk about some buying advice. All right, as far as buying advice goes, <laughs> bigger is better. And certainly the wider you can afford, I would highly recommend. Now here's a cool fact. A lot of the older eight inch jointers can be wired for, they usually say 115, 220 or 120 to 40 on them, which means you can change the wiring diagram to change whether it runs off of single phase 240 or single phase 120. The only difference is gonna be you need to check your amps on your circuit. When you go from 240 to 120, you're gonna double the amount of amp draw that that motor does, but it's still gonna spin the cutter head at the same speed, roughly. I'm sure some electrician will correct me if I'm wrong there, but that's about the gist of it. So. Uh, you know, I've had six inch joiners in the past. Nobody ever said they, they uh, didn't like the extra two inches in an eight inch or the extra four inches in a 12 inch. <laughs> that's what she said? Or that's wrong math there, extra six inches. Sometimes it's better to wait for the right joiner to come up used than it is to just pull the trigger on a six inch because it come, these things just write themselves. Or pull the trigger on a six inch that comes available because you feel like you need a jointer. Most importantly, the cutter head. Segmented cutter heads are a massive, massive difference. They're easier to push material through. You never have to sharpen the blades because you can just rotate the cutters and then replace them if uh, you've used all four sides. And so certainly getting a segmented cutter head is gonna pay dividends down the road as opposed to a straight knife cutter head. So highly recommend going bigger and segmented cutter head if you can. If not, there's some great six inch joiners out there, some old Deltas, some old Rockwells. And the combo machines are great, but the one complaint I always hear from people that buy combo machines is that it's a pain in the ass to change from jointer to planer. So keep that in mind that the added expense of getting a combo machine may, may be better spent buying two separate machines. There's only two things you really need to bring when you go to buy a used joiner, and that's a straight edge or a level and a square. And the square is so that you can set the fence at square and make sure that it holds square. You wanna ensure that all the mechanisms are working correctly, everything's sliding and moving freely. And if they're not, you know, will a little bit of oil uh, fix them up? The other thing that is most important is to ensure that the beds are coplanar and parallel. And you can do that by raising them up with a nice long straight edge or a level. This is probably overkill, but it's just a big level I have in my shop and I can see that both my beds are coplanar and parallel to both corners and they work. And if they're not, you should get a huge discount on that joiner because they're not easy to fix. It may not even be worth your time. It would be worth looking up the manual of the jointer you're going to go look at if you can find it online and see what the adjustment mechanisms are. You wanna make sure that the beds move up and down smoothly. You bring a can of like three in one oil with you if you think that would help you. You know, if it's stuck, you can add a little oil and see if that fixes the problem. If not, it's probably not worth dealing with. And then the last couple pieces of advice I have about buying a used jointer is one, they are heavier than you think. And so if you're going by yourself, ask the person if they can help you load it. Additionally, these almost always come off the bases and worst case scenario, you can take the in feed and out tables off. I recommend not doing it, especially if it's already coplanar, because sometimes you can you know, move things around, but if you have to, you have to. And then just ensure that they're strapped down in your car, even if you have an SUV, just in case you rear end somebody or something like that. And then also don't buy bench top jointers. Brand new, they're like 400 bucks. You can get a used jointer on Craigslist right now from anywhere from four to 600 bucks. And so it's just not worth it because they're not accurate. I mean, the outfeed table's 18 inches at best. And so it's just not gonna be very accurate unless you only do very small things. Lastly, there was one little tip I forgot, which is when you're, if you want a really tight glue up and you've been having problems with a little bit of gap, it may be that your joiner fence is a little out of square. And the way that you can fix that without having to move your joiner fence at all is running opposite sides of your parallel square boards against the fence. So for example, if this was your top of your table and you were gonna do a glue up and this was top of A and top of B, you would run top of A out and then bottom of B out and that way when you fold them together whatever angle your fence was at it's going to equal 90 and you're going to get a seamless glue up all right let me stand up because my knees are starting to kill me johnny brook i don't know how you do this squat all the time so i think that's about all there is to joiners they're actually a really simple machine that just needs to be treated with respect i know most people say they are the scariest 
machine that they own, and I certainly agree with that. So I treat mine with respect, and it's important to really know what you're getting into, especially if it's your first time using one. Guys, thanks for watching. If you want to support the channel, head over to the KM Tools store. Also, sign up for the newsletter where we release an in-depth woodworking article every week, as well as let you know about new products, sales, and special things we have coming out. And I'm not gonna spill any beans, but we got a couple cool things coming out in the next few weeks. So head over to kmtools.com, sign up for that newsletter, and as always, stay safe in the shop.